All right. Um, I think we are live at this point. It looks like it's working. Um, well, uh, I know we didn't announce anything beforehand that I was going to be doing a live stream, but we are doing a live stream. Uh, so welcome if you are one of the couple people that is watching without any announcement at all. Um, <laughs> so uh, welcome to our uh, live Justice Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Uh, we have with us today, Pastor Louis Polzian, who's been on the program before. Uh, and we are supposedly doing a regular series on Henry Esther Jacobs, the summary of the Christian faith. And hey, technically we are, we're moving into something new. Uh, we are actually. It is. It's been six months, so it's better than our record of a year uh, before and, that. And with the previous publications, this would be volume two. So we're right now. We're one. We're like one for one. We're one hundred percent. Yeah, I think we're doing pretty well. <laughs> so we are um, broadcasting today live uh, from our bunker on Mars with the Galactic Federation. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> If you haven't followed recent news, you should. Uh, so you know, people, someone's going to be listening to this in like three years and be like, what in the world? Like, is <laughs> Hey, they're no, they're going to be listening in three years from Mars with our alien friends that are here. So. <laughs> that's true. That's, <laughs> that's what's really happening here. That's really uh, <laughs> so the topic uh, for today is, is a law and gospel. So we will take some of your uh, comments or questions so feel free to, to add questions. I'm following the chat here on my phone right now and I see nothing in the chat, but uh, hopefully some things will come. I usually do this on social media beforehand so people know what we're doing. Um, but we're gonna be discussing the chapter on the law and the gospel in our uh, edition from Justin Center Publications of a Summary of the Christian Faith by Henry Eister Jacobs. So I know when we started this, we had like an older two volume edition, but at this point we have our nice, much- It's very pretty. Much prettier version. Very um, pretty. Yes, and the typos and things have been corrected, at least for the most mm, part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're talking about law and gospel. And uh, so, Lewis, you also are doing a project for us for the Widener Institute. I am. We're currently recording a course on law and gospel. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you're doing. I know it's, it's not going to be out for a little while. Uh, we probably will post at least a clip um, to get people interested a little bit of, <laughs> of what's coming up. But uh, yeah, why don't you to tell everyone what you're currently working on? Well, I'm actually earning my position as a fellow with the Wider Institute, uh, finally. And uh, we're working on, we're going through um, uh, Walter's Law and Gospel. I've got the book right here. Uh, you can find this from Justin Center Publications as well. It's a wonderful yes thick volume. Um, and it's a whole lot cheaper than uh, some of the other volumes that are out there and uh, definitely worthwhile to get. But we're going to be using that. And we're basically going to be going through each thesis uh, that Walter puts out one by one in about 15, 20 minute segments thereabouts. Uh, and, and looking at them, uh, trying to distinguish that not just for preaching, so it's good for pastors, uh, because obviously I'll be approaching it from that angle, uh, but also just uh, doing it in your daily life. What does law and gospel look like um, uh, in your daily life as a Christian. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're, it's, it's taking a little bit of time because there are 25 theses, so it's going to take a while uh, to get through all of those and, and record those. But, uh, but we're going to hopefully have that up um, uh, January, February of next year. Yeah, that's great. And like I said, we'll try to post something beforehand to get you all excited to so get a preview of. Uh, I don't what's know if anybody's going to be there. honestly all that excited. You should be. You I should look be. at those great. videos. And I'm like, I cannot believe the way that I blink. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody I, feels that way when they apparently watch. Apparently, I do this a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's like yeah. listening to your own voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it is always a little weird. You get used to it, I guess, though. At least yeah. I have at this point anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, with that, uh, so Pastor Paulzine is our fellow of practical theology. So this is kind of a great fit for him to be doing something on law and gospel and just applying it practically. So that kind of follows on to, uh, you know, on the back of the course that we are offering now on uh, the Christian life, Introduction to the Christian Life where I spend an hour on law and gospel there, and that'll be kind of an intro. Uh, and then this is a good follow-up uh, to get a lot more in depth on that, that subject and how it applies. So let's jump right into the text uh, of Jacob's on the law and the gospel. So the, the question of law and gospel is 
really like the distinctive Lutheran thing, right? If, if there's anything that's distinctively Lutheran, it's, well, the centrality of justification, but along with that is this distinction between um, law and gospel. So it's pretty essential to, to our theology. It's pretty essential to our practice, um, both as, as pastors and laity as well. Uh, so let's just define law and gospel. What exactly is law and gospel? Uh, and if you you know, you don't have to just read the definition, but I, uh, well, give me a definition of law, a short definition of law and gospel. Uh, a law, the law is basically anything that tells you what to do in the gospel uh, in terms of salvation, uh, because that's the way that the gospels use. Law can be used in a lot of different ways, right. uh, but uh, the gospel specifically is about salvation and it can only be used in terms of what Christ has done uh, for your sake, for your salvation. Um and so, you know, I, a lot of times it's divided up and, and um, Jacobs does this too. Is he divides it up as command and promise uh, right. is a way that's spoken. And I think that's perfectly fine too. There's, there's really no, um, there's no command in scripture that we have to use the words law and gospel. Uh, there's only the command uh, to understand the two ways that God speaks. And that's uh, what we find in the scriptures is that the two ways that God speaks to us are law and gospel or command and promise. Um, so that should give us a little bit of uh, uh, a hermeneutic uh, to read the scriptures, uh, looking for those two categories. And, and yes, of course, there are other areas that are not law and gospel in particular in the scriptures, the historical um, uh, genealogies, um, uh, any kind of recounting a narrative uh, may not specifically be law or gospel, but if you look at the sweeping scope of what those are accomplishing, it's going to fit directly into one of that. So you can't break down every word and say, this is a word of law. This is a word of gospel. You have to look at the scope of what the author is trying to do because being inspired by the Holy spirit, um, God is going to speak those words uh, in law and gospel, because we confess that's the way that he speaks to us through command and promise. Right. Yeah. I think it's really important to see that these are like overarching themes and they are not something you can just kind of break down say this verse is law, this verse is gospel. And sometimes you can do that. Sometimes uh, you can do that. Yeah. But a lot of times when people do that, they end up shoehorning what God is actually saying into yes. something that doesn't really fit. Um, right. Which is why, you know, if you take like the Sermon on the Mount, for example, uh, blessed are the peacemakers, you know, blessed are the meek, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, I've, I've seen it shoehorned both ways, as that's law and it's gospel, mm -hmm. you know, as if the Sermon on the Mount is going to be one or the other, um, you know, because while it's true, those things are referring to Jesus and who he is, the meek, the, the peacemaker, the, the, the right. one who mourns. Um, Jesus is all of those things. And in that sense, you could say, oh, look at this beautiful gospel that we see Jesus doing all of this for us. But you, you would be, I mean, Jesus specifically also makes it about you, where he says, blessed right. are you. And so you can't just say, oh, well, Jesus is making it all about him. And so all of a sudden now, it becomes law. Well, you should be meek. You need to do meekness. You need to mourn. You right. need to be a peacemaker. And if you're not doing those things, then then you're a sinner. You know, and I think you have to pull that out. You can't shoehorn it one way or the other. Sometimes it, it speak. You just you need to let Scripture speak what it's going to speak. When it speaks law, you go with the law. When it goes with the gospel, you go with the gospel. And this is, I'm going to yeah. hop on my soapbox, but this is one of the biggest things that drives me crazy um, in, in terms of uh, homiletics, uh, being able to preach a sermon and put a sermon together. Um, people say, you know, you've got to do a law and gospel uh, sermon, to which I'll agree. Your sermon probably needs law and it probably needs gospel. And I probably actually go a little bit off of Walther from this. Um, and that might just be because I've read a too much Luther, um, and certainly too much Chrysostom. Um, but when you look at their sermons, you know, their sermons are set up to go along with what the, the scriptures are saying, whatever scripture they're preaching on, that's what's set up for the day. Um, Walther would say, you know, let the gospel predominate. And we don't want to disagree with that in terms of the gospel and all of its sweetness, but you can't, you can't take that and say, then every sermon has to finish with a gospel word. Because if you, if you do right. that, again, you're not finishing the, wor the way that scripture does. I mean, haven't you ever sat in the church and you've heard the gospel lesson? Um, you know, and, and um, uh, let me think of like a really awful one. Um, 
you know, if Jesus were to say something like, cursed are you if you reject me, that this is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've all had those. We've all had those. You know, and you're going, you're going this is ridiculous. Um, and so you kind of look at that and, and yeah. you just have to say, all right, so if scripture is going to leave it off on there, then it must yeah. allow me to leave off there too. And that's why right. in Luther's sermons, I, I cannot remember which one it is, but he ends one of his sermons. I mean, it is like a scathing law sermon. He is just destroying his people. And you're just, you're like begging for some kind of gospel there. And then all of a sudden he goes, and that's all that I have to say for today on that. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you know, granted, they're probably going to come back later that day and, and, and get, you know, more content. But, you know, the nice thing is what Luther understood is that as we preach law and gospel, the entire service should be filled with law and gospel. Right. And, you know, he knew if, he, if you leave it at a, at a harsh word, well, what comes very quickly after a sermon is the Holy Supper. And so the people are going to, yeah, they'll, they'll, they're going to sit in their conviction for the next 10 minutes or whatever it takes to get there. And then all of a sudden they are going to have uh, the sweetest Jesus come into their mouths and, and give them the forgiveness that they are, have been um, smarting after, uh, you know, for the, yeah. that 10 minutes or whatever. Um, so, you know, I, you just, you can't just say we've got to split it up. And they have to be so, I mean, they have to be, they do have to be carefully delineated, but yeah, they have to be kept separate. You can't keep these two things separate. They go, they have to be distinguished and yet still together. Um, and they have to be together in the appropriate manner, because if they're not together in the appropriate manner, then, then you're just not speaking the way that scripture is. I mean, yeah. very plainly, you're just not speaking that way. Yeah, I think, you know, thinking through what you say about Luther and kind of letting the law, the word of, of law actually do its work is really is really key because I see in a lot of Lutheran uh, preaching is tendency to use the law and say the law, but then kind of quickly move yeah. on, you know? Yeah. Here's the law, but... Yeah. the gospel. And, yeah. and it doesn't, you're a sinner, but you know, Jesus died for exactly. that. Exactly. And, and so <laughs> what it doesn't do when you do that is it doesn't give you the, the law. It's time to do its work. Like there are right. times where you need to kind of sit in it and really recognize your sin. I mean, that's why we have these penitential seasons, right? We have uh, Lent and to some extent Advent is supposed to be, but nobody really does that uh, anymore. But, but we are supposed to actually let the law do its work in us instead of kind of just steamrolling over it or just using it as like a little footnote in the sermon to make sure yeah there's law there but yeah. the gospel yeah uh, it, it's yeah, really you've key. got if you don't let the if you don't let the law live um then you are discounting uh half of the way that god is going to speak to you right at least half yeah. of it yeah yeah i know absolutely mm -hmm. um yeah so as we're talking about you know law and gospel here um Jacob's just asked the question, is it the, because we're talking about kind of misunderstandings, right? I'm just saying, well, this is law, this is gospel. Mm -hmm, Sermon on the Mount mm -hmm. is a great example because that's one that people debate. Is it law or gospel? Because it's clearly Christological, like it's clearly. clearly pointing to Christ, but it's also clearly ethical. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so do we say that's a confusion of law and gospel? Do we say it has to be one or the other? Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's, and that's the, the, the preaching task. I mean, that's, that's yes. the goal of the pastor. And honestly, I could probably preach that sermon, you know, 15 different ways and not one of them would yeah. be the same. And I think that has to be okay. It just depends on what your people need to hear at that moment. Exactly. Um, and as we talk about in my series, it's not up to even the, it's not up to the pastor, however, to decide how those things are going to hit their people. Um, that's up to the Holy spirit. If the Holy spirit's going to use that in terms of the law you know, is he going to convict them? Is he going to, um, uh, is he going to keep them in line? Is he going to show them what they should be doing? That's up to his use of those laws. Of, of, or I should, let me just put it this way. That's up to the Holy Spirit, how he decides to use the law on a person. If I'm preaching the gospel, it's also then up to the Holy Spirit. Right. If he's going to hit that, uh, you know, with the gospel, he could also, I know, even the phrase, Jesus died for me. That can be both law and gospel. Gospel, certainly we go, okay, this is wonderful. You know, that Jesus died for me. But what if you are um, really just swimming in your sin and you have no one coming to you and forgiving your sin and you, you read about this Jesus and you go, Jesus died for me. I am so awful that Jesus had to die for right. me. I mean, it, without the, the absolution, um, that can easily be something that is uh, law filled for you. So the preaching task comes in and, and works to distinguish those things, but the Holy Spirit then uses those things to affect you. 
Yeah, I think as you look at, you know, Peter's sermon at Pentecost, that's exactly what he does with with the cross is you killed him, right? Yeah. It's in their cut to the heart. So the cross is the greatest example of both law and gospel, because it mm-hmm. shows you what what the ultimate penalty of law is, which is death, yes. Yes. Uh, the death of God's eternal uh, only begotten son. And also, it's, of course, the gospel. What is the gospel but the death of, of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins? So if, if, if the cross itself can be both law and gospel in a sense, then anything can be, right. <laughs> really. Right. And, and um, you know, Jacob's asked this question regarding the Old and New Testaments here. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes I think, especially when you, when you look at some of the church fathers, they often use the term law for the Old Testament and gospel for New Testament. They don't mean that all of the laws all command all of the New Testament is all just promises. Right. It's kind of a summary term, mm-hmm. um, especially dealing with Martian. So, you know, Jacob's, you know, is asking that question to correct that. Say, do, do, are we saying, right, that the, the Old Testament is all like the, the law harsh stuff and the New Testament is all of the nice Jesus-y stuff mm-hmm. in kind of a Martianite fashion of, is the Old Testament bad in the New Testament? God, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Angry but God versus nice God. And that's not exactly. really it at all. I mean, think about, I, whenever we have a reading from Isaiah in the church, I am uh, always so hard pressed not to say, although I probably still could, um, a reading from the gospel according to Isaiah. Yeah. Um, because if you read Isaiah, I mean, it is like, it, it's in many ways, uh, sw- the, the passages that are in it, uh, that are this way are sweeter even often than what we find in the new Testament um, in terms of the, the gospel effect on us. Um, right. And, you know, so you find that all over the place, but, or, or look at Jesus. I mean, you know, he, he <laughs> you've heard it said um, you, you shall not murder, but I tell you the truth. If you hate your brother in your heart, you have, you are guilty of murdering him. So Jesus actually uh, deepens the law. He, he brings our understanding right. back to what it should be. Um, but in a way that, I mean, it, it, it almost feels like he's, he's piling law upon law and he is for a good reason, but, um, you know, you can't just say, well, Jesus has brought the gospel. He did, but that's not all he did because he's God. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, and that's key to see Jesus himself is very much a messenger of the law in some ways, mm-hmm. uh, in, in his ministry, he was a, a preacher of law and gospel. But even yeah. if you look back at you know, Moses, it's not like Moses is, is a pure, is purely preaching law. I mean, we think of things like the curses of Deuteronomy mm-hmm. under the law, and God certainly used Moses as this instrument of, of delivering the law to, to the Israelites in this, this profound and unique way. Um, but Moses also serves as this deliverer figure through, mm-hmm. um, you know, the land of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. And uh, so, it, really, the, the minister of God is called to proclaim both law and gospel, and that means that the Old and New Testaments both proclaim law and gospel. And mm-hmm. We could certainly say that some individuals probably preach more law than they do gospel, and some probably more gospel than law, and that's just their unique circumstance. Mm-hmm. You know, reading through, uh, you know, the prophet Jeremiah, for example, uh, can feel like a lot of very heavy condemnation, because Jeremiah is preaching to a people that doesn't listen whatsoever, and, and mm-hmm. they didn't need the gospel <laughs> yeah. at that point. You know, they, they, they needed to hear the law. Again, getting it kind of reiterating that idea that the law actually needs to do its work and it needs to sink in instead of just using it as this little footnote before you get to the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there are, there are times for that. And, and you get at that with just speaking about the, the pastoral application, which is really where Walther's getting at in his proper distinction between law and gospel is there are people that need to hear the law and there are people that need to hear the gospel. Now in a congregation on a Sunday morning, of course, you can't go person to person and discover, but figure out what they need and preach to every individual separately. Um, that's the role of the spirit to, to apply it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, when you are doing say pastoral counseling with somebody or speaking with someone on one-on-one, I think you really do get that uh, opportunity to kind of figure out what do they need to the best yeah. of your ability, right? Yeah. Do they need law or do they need gospel? So yeah. How- I mean, the mother, the mother who comes in after miscarrying her baby, you don't go, right. you don't look at her and say, well, you know, your baby died because you were a sinner, right? You know, I mean, how awful would that be if your pastor did that? Well, some pastors do things like that. Well, I know. And how awful is that? That's not what I mean. Yeah. She obviously is, is she knows she's a sinner. The, their baby's dead. Um, you know, so what do you, the pastor doesn't just leave it there. You know, the pastor is able to preach the gospel in, in such a way that is going to affect her. And that's, and that's part of the art of distinguishing long. And it's a, it's a lifelong yeah. um, uh, lesson to learn how to do this. It's not something you can just get right off the bat. 
uh, and you're always going to mess it up. So you need to come back to what is right and true. Um, but it, it takes time. It, it really does. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so just discuss it as an art, right? The art of dividing law and gospel. We have this quote from Luther that's cited here where he says, this distinction between law and gospel is the highest art in Christianity, which all who boast or accept the Christian name can or should know. For where there is a defect on this point, a Christian cannot be distinguished from a heathen or a Jew. <laughs> for it is just here that the difference lies. Of course, Luther with his bold rhetoric there. Um, but but getting at the the, the idea that this is central to Christianity. This is an art. And, you know, as you pointed out before, it doesn't really matter whether you're using the terms law and gospel, you know, because I know when you bring this, this up, um, you know, people will say, well, the church fathers don't use the distinction law and gospel in this way, but they certainly have the distinction in mind, whatever terms they want to use when they're applying things to people as pastors. And I think that's really where you see the, the heart of this is in that practical application. And, you need to learn when when it is that you apply warnings and wrath to people and when it is that you give people the promises of God and the free grace in Christ. And that is, those questions are things that everyone needs to deal with, right? Everyone in, in ministry has to deal with those questions in, in one way or another, whether you want to call it the law gospel distinction or not. Uh, this is just an extremely helpful way to categorize these things in in, in a biblical way. Uh, yeah. Because certainly the terms law and gospel are, are scriptural ones. Um, and, and, you know, we can speak more specifically about texts that, that talk about it. Uh, but let's just go through, you know, first talking about the law and then the gospel. Who is the person who needs to hear the law? Yeah. Uh, the person who needs the law is somebody who is secure in their sins. Um, so either to say, I have no need of repentance uh, because I'm, I'm not that bad. Or uh, the person who believes that, uh, they can win for themselves salvation. Um, and so those people need the law preached in all of its sternness uh, to convict them um, and, and hurt them in a real sense, uh, yeah. to wound their pride, to kill them, to destroy them, to break them down. Um, that's the person that needs the law. Um, the person who needs instruction for how to live. So, I mean, so yes, we, we obviously preach the law and its sternness uh, in that way, but we would, I think, be remiss because a lot of um, people who call themselves Lutheran today uh, get this wrong too, is that we also do need to preach the law to people who are wondering, what do we do? What should I do? What, yes. what does my life look like? And that is the law. And, and while that is, it, it, certainly it can be accusing, um, it's not like that's the only thing that it does. It, it, even in that, as a, as a um, uh, re, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? As it, well, as a converted believer, as a repentant believer, um, to hear the law in that way actually can be sometimes a comfort. Yeah. Um, you know, because every time we preach the doctrine of vocation, um, I don't know about you, but I mean, I do that because it's a comfort to say, Mm -hmm. these things are good works and God is pleased with them. Um, so keep on doing them. I mean, yes, that's, that's the law, but in a way, because now I've been saved by Christ, that actually is a comfort to me uh, because he's given me that job to do and, and I rejoice in doing it now. Yeah. And that, that's what Luther does ultimately in the large catechism, as you mm -hmm. read his exposition of, of the commandments, especially when he applies it to teaching children, you know, and, and this is what you find with, you know, doing premarital counseling, for example, with with a Christian couple is, mm -hmm. you know, they, they come to you, well, maybe they just come to you because they know it's a prerequisite for you doing their wedding. But, you know, uh, often they enjoy doing that because they want to work through issues and they want to know, you know, they're not coming to be told, uh, hey, you you two um, are both terrible sinners and that's it. Or just to say you're forgiven, you know, that certainly is an important part. But they also want to know, like, we're here to get counseling because we want to practically know what it means to be a Christian couple. Yeah. What is it? What are my duties as a husband? How do I live that out? What are my duties as a wife? How do I live that out? What does it mean when we're parents? How do we live that out? It doesn't have to be just in family roles, but that's just one very practical circumstance. But um, so it's a problem when you are looking at the law only in this negative sense, right? You're only thinking of um, what we call the, the second use of the law, right? So that the law shows you your sin. Now that's important and essential, especially when we're distinguishing it from the gospel. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the only function or role that the law has. The law has a positive role in the life of the Christian, yeah. struck us in, in what we are to do. And, and we should, should delight in that as, as David does in Psalm uh, 119. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then let's talk about the gospel. So law, that's who needs to hear the law, right? We've got the person who is, um, living in, in open unrepentant sin, like they're prideful. They're not dealing with their sin. They need to hear the law because they need the crushing of the law. The, the Christian who just needs instruction as to what they do with their life, how they serve in their various vocations, how it is that they can serve their neighbor. Um, but then we have the gospel. Who is it that needs to hear the gospel? And don't just say everyone, because it's true, <laughs> but let's get a little more specific than that. No, I mean, specifically, it's, it's the person who is um, repentant, the person who is um, looking at their sins and despairing, looking at yeah. uh, their life and, and, and just wondering, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, what, what hope there is for them. Um, yeah. This person especially does need to hear the gospel um, in, in these ways, you know, when, when the person is broken by the law, and, and this is really using that word broken in a real sense, um, you know, not just, I, again, I find so many different people use the word broken, like, like that's the, um, the it's the, like the new buzz phrase for Lutherans or something like that, you know, like, I, I think sometimes to use the term brokenness is to, there's nothing wrong with the term, but, but, no, but no. sometimes I think people use it's, that term to kind of avoid using the harsher term to, of yeah, sin. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it the sounds a little nicer around it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I'm not using it in that sense. I'm using it in the sense of, um, crushed under the weight of their sin, crushed yeah. by, um, the, the absolute, uh, depravity that they have. Um, and we all should. I mean, feel this way. And if we're yeah. not, then there's probably an issue with us. But, um, you know, the person who, who is sitting in that kind of thing, they need that gospel. They need to hear right. that Jesus is for them. Um, they need to hear all of the wonderful things um, that God would bring to them through the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, because that news is specifically and especially for them. Um, and, and this goes back in many ways to our discussion on subjective justification. Um, you know, in that moment, um, saying something like Jesus died for the world is just not enough for them. Yeah. But to say to them that broken sinner, uh, that Jesus Christ died for you, or um, that Jesus has redeemed you, that um, Jesus has promised he will make this situation better. Jesus has promised that he will raise your baby from the dead, you know, whatever it may be. Um, yeah. Subjective justification comes in that sense through that preaching office to be able to distinguish rightly what they need to hear about the gospel. Yeah, yeah. That, that particularizing <clears throat> of the gospel that you have with, of course, the Lord's Supper or the, um, you know, given for you. This is how you know mm -hmm. it's you as an individual. Yeah. You are the one tasting this, yeah. not yeah. just just in the ab in, in the general sense. Yeah, um, as comforting as that can be. There's the Jesus who gave Himself up for me, as as yeah. Paul tells us. For for me, you know that I mean right. that, that should that's our response to that, right? Right. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't know why I'm coughing. I don't have the COVID. Uh oh. <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, yeah, that he would that your response would be. He would do this even for me. Like, that's so amazing. You know, that's our, our response to the gospel. And if yeah. you don't have that response at hearing the gospel, um, then you may need more of the law, you know, yeah. because in that case, you may not understand just exactly how bad you are. Uh, that Jesus, even though you were his enemy, even though you would prefer to bash his head in with a brick, he died for you. Right. Um, you know, I, I mean, and if we don't realize that, then, then we have a problem. Yeah. And I think, so already discussing, right. Who needs to hear the law? Who needs to hear the gospel? Um, let's talk about the, the ways that it messes things up when you give someone the gospel who yeah. needs the law or give someone the law who needs the gospel. So let's start with, oh. um, well, here, just, just here's the obvious one. Then I'll get, well, I'll get into the, the two others, but this one is just obvious, which is, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, pastor, I need some guidance here. And all you do is tell them they're forgiven and don't actually give them any guidance. Um, that person wanted the law and needs the law in the third use. I've, I've seen pastors who refuse to do this because they're like, well, I don't want to make you a legalist, which, which right. is absurd. Um, so I think that should be absurd on, on its face. But moving beyond that to the other two situations, um, the one is the individual who is broken by their sin, who is given the law. And, and you see this a lot in certain, you know, preachers who I've criticized, 
uh, very introspective kind of leaning uh, preaching, which mm -hmm. basically says, well, you need to make sure you're saved. You need to make sure you know you're saved by looking at your fruits. Yeah. Essentially, someone is in despair and you don't point them to the gospel, you point them to the law. So yeah. what's the problem with that? Well, the, the problem is where the result of that goes. Um, and the result, it, it ends up in one of two ways. One is that um, they grow deeper in the, their despair and there is no mm -hmm. end to it for them. Um, and it cycles down. And, and often I think what we see in these cases is um, uh, either suicide attempts or yeah. um, uh, anything that would disrupt the pattern of their life, like uh, uh, going uh, seeking a divorce or, um, uh, you know, cutting family off. Or, I mean, it ends up in a really bad place because you're more and more despairing. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that happened, it's related to it, but it, it so it's kind of like, um, the other half of the same side of the coin, um, is that instead of despair, they look at that and they go, well, then what's the point? Um, and they just, they're like, well, if, you know, forget it. I, I can't do it. I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to do what I want. I'm going to eat, drink, uh, right. and be merry because tomorrow I'm going to die. And apparently I'm going to go to hell no matter what I do. Uh, so it's either this deep, dark despair that you enter into, or it's um, just a, a laissez-faire attitude about everything in life. Yeah. And I, I see, I've seen this many times. I've seen mm -hmm. this with people who have uh, been under the influence of certain, you know, I mean, I mentioned Paul Washer as kind of the great example of this. And, yeah. you know, I've it's known people who... to me that so many people pick him out as like a great preacher. And I, while I yeah. admit he, he is, his rhetorical style is engaging, his content is just so like, check your fruits, check your fruits, check your fruits, check your, you know, but Jesus, but check your fruits. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. I just don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Where the gospel, anytime it is mentioned is really followed with a but. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I, you know, it, it's regularly, I, you know, when I did my two podcasts on Paul Washer, this was years ago now. I remember um, those podcasts. Just, I mean, those are by far my most listened to podcasts because people find this themselves in this circumstance all the time. It, it's just mm -hmm. about every week that I get, still get an email from somebody saying, Hey, I uh, was about to give up my faith or I was about to commit suicide or, uh, I mean, constantly really, I know, I mean, this, I know, this is, I know. And people saying, then I heard your podcast yeah. and I realized that, wait, maybe this guy's not right. Yeah. Um, and, see, you know, I'm not saying not to take credit for, for that, but no, I'm just saying no. like, this is the reality of what this does to people when you mess yeah. this up. Yeah, no, it really is. And I, I mean, this is where the danger of, of evangelicalism goes because yeah. it's, it's constantly going to point you to these kinds of people. You know, I mean, I, one of the things that I do to keep informed as to what's going on, I mean, I listen to podcasts pretty much all day, um, but from all over different areas uh you know i've got a a couple of um roman uh podcasts um i've got a few evangelicals and it's just it's amazing like the evangelical ones are so much worse than the roman podcasts yeah totally no i, <laughs> uh, I totally they just because they shut they shove you towards guys who are are sitting there and and it it becomes legalistic and everything yeah. um and you just you die you die in that um because there's really no other option for you it's it's just it's just so sad. Yeah, because Rome has the means of grace, right? Rome has an understanding of, of the sacraments, so there's still something yeah. objective. And, and of course, yeah. we have plenty to criticize about Rome and their yeah. theology of assurance, but but they're, they have the sacraments, right? And when you don't have, when all you have is your internal state and you don't have any emphasis on anything external that is given to you, mm -hmm. what what do you have to grab onto? Yeah, well, and you know, so, you know, we do have a comment in the chat from Imperial, um, asking about was Saul hard at heart at birth or that he had been given over to that yeah. state through repetitive. This actually is, is tied into this. Was Saul hard at heart at, at birth? Yes, because he was a sinner. He was conceived in sin. Um, you know, was he, I, I'm assuming that they're talking um, King Saul, not uh, Saul who became Paul. I assume uh, so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so of course he was. I mean, aren't we all? Uh, it's only by the grace of God that we're brought to um, something that looks like repentance, something that looks like, right. um, you know, for Saul, it was on the eighth day when he had his circumcision, he was brought into the covenant. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, that was an act certainly of the law, but it was bringing them into the, the community of Israel. And, and he did his, um, you know, he did his sacrifices that were required that was never not done. Um, and so, you know, he was absolutely 
uh, gods in that sense. But then, yes, through repetitive conscious sin, um, through giving into uh, the way of, of the law, giving into um, I can do this on my own, I can do this by my own power, I can, you know, by that then he ultimately ended retracting you know, his faith from him. Uh, and became harder and harder and harder against what God was doing out of his own pride. And this is, so, you know, what he needed was a preacher. <laughs> um, you know, he, he needed someone to come to him and, and be able to preach on this, that, that uh, you know, ultimately that, that person wouldn't be killed, but, but that's all would hear it and repent. Um, and so that becomes really a, just a, a, a way for us to look at everything and say, you know, if, if Paul, if Saul had had that, then he certainly would have been um, in a better state toward the end, even though God had transferred uh, the kingship to David, um, you know, looking towards Saul's death, um, you know, that Saul still could have been one who was saved as it is. We, yeah. we kind of stand there and we go, you know, not, not really sure. I mean, you know, it seems like he was damned, but we'll, we'll have to see. Um. Yeah, I'm looking through the chat here. I know I didn't mention anything beforehand, so I didn't get a bunch of people in the chat, but there are, there are some comments. Let's, let's see what people say. Mm -hmm. Oh, how about this, Lewis? Do you think that praying the rosary is the best way to avoid mortal sin and remain on the path to heaven? No, I mean, that's, that's more of the same, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, isn't that just what we're talking about? That like, if, if, you're, if you're sitting in your sin and you're wondering how to repent, the answer to that is not do more things, do more law, do more, uh, you know, pray this prayer, um, you know, and, and you'll feel better and, and you'll become more holy. You know, it's not like God, I mean, does God sanctify us through our good works? Absolutely. Does God sanctify us through our prayers? Yes. Does he sanctify you through your prayers to Mary? No. Um, right. And so, you know, but I mean, you look at that and you go, yes, I, I do in that way become more sanctified through my prayer, but doing that is not telling me about the comfort that I need now that I'm in my law right. convicted state. I don't need more law heaped up at this moment. Um, that is not right. going to help me. And that's only going to make me more of a legalist, which is where ultimately a lot of the Roman system goes. Right. Um, okay. So uh, let's see, I have some other, other comments here. People are talking about um, Paul Washer. Isn't he great against easy believism though? Uh, and I would say no. I think, because... I think he's great. I think it means greatly against e easy believism. You think he what? Sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm wondering, is, is, is that that he's really, really good against easy believism or is he very much against easy? Is he good against it? Like, is he valuable? Is his yeah. insight oh, on yeah. topic valuable? Yeah. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, is easy believism wrong in the like one saved, always saved, say the sinner's prayer and don't worry about daily repentance and you're still saved? Is that wrong? Yes. Yes. Is Paul Washer the answer to it? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, ultimately I would also say that, I mean, from our perspective, you can like mortal sin is a thing, um, not, not just in the Roman Catholic sense, but in the sense that you can cut yourself off from grace. So there are those genuine law warnings. And I think probably within a, a uh, the system that Paul Washer is working in, you kind of have two options for a lot of individuals. It's either easy believism, as in you say the prayer once, the sinner's prayer, and you're you're good to go, or you jump into this other mode of you have to know that you're really saved because you have to know that you won't be one of those who perseveres. Um, oh. But a, I think a proper proclamation of, of law and gospel will recognize that in first of all, the person who's despairing needs the gospel. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah. yeah. It also recognizes that when a believer is engaging in serious sin, they need to hear warnings that they can be cut off from Christ and, mm -hmm. or cut themselves off really. Um, and, and they can walk away. And that's a warning that, that they need to hear. So the, the answer to easy, easy believism, I would say is- Lutheranism? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is. No, it's, it's law and gospel and it's, and it's proper proclamation. So you don't yeah. get to overreact to an error with another error, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't, that, that doesn't solve the issue. And I think that's what someone like Paul Washer does. It's true that he's calling out bad theology, but he's giving bad theology as an answer to bad theology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah. You were taught just, that as a kid and, and it's even more true in theology. Yeah. He does preach against a sinner's prayer. That's a good thing. Right. I mean, we don't agree with that, <laughs> of course, um, but praying against being against something that is bad does not make you good. Right. In, in what yeah. you preach or proclaim. I, it, the, 
you can stand against whatever you want, but if people know you for what you're standing against rather than right. what you're standing for, then there's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so. Um, and I see one other comment that, which says uh, Esau was in the covenant people of Israel, but he wasn't saved. Um, I'm, I, not I've, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I'm not sure about that either. I, I don't think that scripture is clear about that. Yeah. I, I know. I know scripture says, you know, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, but that's not given in terms of a salvific um, end for either of them. In fact, we saw, we see Esau in the story of Jacob coming back to the faith and re, and embracing his brother um you know we don't see him rejecting that so i'm not sure we uh, yeah i think the the love and hate comment is is more in line with um the the blessing that was given uh from isaac um and what that means for the line of the messiah Uh, that's that's exactly right and that's but i mean malachi you know romans 9 cites this but it's in malachi malachi specifically refers to the edomites so i i don't think it has to do with national blessing and God certainly chose to reject who would normally be the heir, which was the firstborn son, mm-hmm. and give the blessing to the secondborn. Yeah. I mean, that's the point of Romans nine. I don't, I don't yeah. think contextually either in in Romans nine or in um, Malachi or in the narrative of Genesis itself, there's any indication that he was necessarily not saved. So I, I don't. Yeah, no. I mean, certainly. Again, you're right. I mean, it's, it's not what you would expect. But the point of that is to point to the coming of Christ. In that sense, yeah, Jacob exactly. is the type of Christ, not who you expect, yes. um, not not the way that it it normally works. <laughs> um, you know, and, and so and that's a, you know, that's really the point of, in many ways, picking Jacob. Because could God have made him uh, Jesus come through the line of Esau? Absolutely. Um, but you know, Esau's line is the one who ultimately gives a whole lot of flack to the Israelites. Uh, and so there's a lot going on in there too. You know, God has set that up yeah. um, again as a picture of Christ in the church and the world. So, yeah, no, that's great. So let's move on then to okay. and feel, feel free to keep asking questions, but um, yes. yeah, I want to move on to, to a question that I think is really key because, because we've already addressed who doesn't need to hear the law, but there also are people that don't need to hear the gospel. And I, I think this probably gets me- messed up more by us Lutherans, because we always want the gospel to predominate as Walter says, and, and the gospel is the heart of our theology and it, it, it should be. I don't be. want to talk about this. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, so here's the problem. You get, you get somebody who um, uh, is unrepentant, somebody who- I'm not asking you to talk about a specific circumstance. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, Even though it's, you may think I am asking No, that, it's, I don't, I know. It just, it's just, on, it's on my heart. Um, yeah. and so you, you end up with somebody who, who is sitting, um, you know, so free in the, in the gospel, like, you know, uh, this is, you know, my, my sin's not that bad or, you know what, and you give more gospel, it just gives them license again to go out and sin however yeah. they want. So you end up kind of in the second state of the, you know, you give law to law, except this person is tricked, not into, um, there is no salvation for me. Now they're just tricked into this. Nothing can make me lose this salvation. Yes. Um, and so they, they end up doing the same thing as the person who doesn't, you know, care at all about obeying the law. They do the exact same stuff, but now they think that they're, you know, of Christ in this um, and that there's no consequence for this. Um, and it really just has messed up so much of modern Christianity, not to mention modern Lutheranism, uh, like the last 20 years Um we have the radical Lutherans because of this, you know, I'm not going to go into specifics, uh, but, but, but yeah. th- that movement has come out of this gospel to gospel r- the ratio. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the idea that you find there that there are no earthly consequences to your sins because of the gospel. Yeah. And, sick. and God does not promise that. Um, I mean, David has to suffer the death of his own son because of, yeah. his sin which is horrible i mean it's a horrible yeah, thing but that's very clearly laid out in scripture that his son died because he slept with bathsheba and murdered yes. uriah and because of that the blood of his son is on his head like it like god is very clear that's the earthly yeah. consequence of his sin um it's not just we're going oh well you know that's probably what it is or you know to teach david a lesson you know to get him not to you know that no god says i'm killing this kid because you did this. Yes. Um, 
and we we need we don't have that in our lives we don't have god usually speaking and saying i'm going to make you suffer because you did this particular sin um but we should expect that yeah 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 so it doesn't mean no consequences for sins it also you know and i think this is really this is really important because i i've honestly seen this in a number of circumstances where someone uses the gospel or abuses the gospel to, as a message of, well, as a message of control towards someone else to say, you need to forgive me. Yeah. Right. Like, like if, if you're using the gospel to say, if you're a Christian, you will forgive me for whatever terrible thing you did to that person. A- and it becomes then a way to like control somebody it's, instead it's of hammer smashing their brains in. It is, which is exactly the role of the law, but it's not the law. Right. And it, it's, but an, it is it's, the law dressed up like it, in drag, like the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, and, and just as, as it's weird in, in life and, and not normal in life for people to do that, it is not normal for the law to be in drag as the gospel <laughs> or the gospel to be in drag as the law. Yeah. It just, yeah. you can't, yeah. you can't do it. Um, that's not the proper distinction. And when you do that, you mess up the message of God. You cannot, right. if you are doing this, you are not preaching the full counsel of the word of God. Yeah. You just are not because God doesn't speak that way. I think another point that I want to make, which I think is really key is you don't get to decide when you need the law and when you need the gospel, no, like you need, no. you need a preacher, right? You, because this is what we do. We like to say, well, I did this thing to hurt you, but I don't want to deal with the consequences. So I'm forgiven and I'm in Christ. And maybe go as far as to say, and you better forgive me and ignore it, or you don't really believe the gospel. Or, uh, you know, we, we do the opposite, which is we're feeling in despair over our sin. Our natural inclination is to grab onto the law and to just beat ourselves up continually over and over and over again. And, and so when it's just this internal thing that we decide what we need, you know, we, this is why we need the external word. We need to hear it from outside it's, of us. It's why God is an extra no God. Everything that he does is outside of us. He very few things. I mean, if you think about it, does he do within us? Um, aside from putting faith in you, <clears throat> you know, um, everything else comes from the outside. Forgiveness comes from the outside. Uh, the Lord's Supper comes from the outside. Baptism comes from the outside. Um I mean, the food that we eat that God gives us through his grace that, I mean, everything God does is from outside of us. So why would we think that we are, um, right. that God is going to be speaking to our hearts to tell us what we do or do not need to hear at the moment. He, he, that's not how he yeah. works. Yeah. And the law comes from outside of us too. And, and of course we have the internal moral sense, you know, that yeah. Paul speaks about in Romans too, but we can't trust in our heart to tell us what is right and wrong because we right. have this thing called a seared conscience. Um, we, even as Christians, but we can't, this is why we need the third function of the law. As Christians, we don't get to just invent what we think good works are depending on what we want to do. Mm-hmm. We have to listen to the word of God. And, and mm-hmm. this is what Luther gets at in a lot of his writings, but I think especially of the, the large catechism and his exposition of the commandments is he's railing against what happened in the medieval church not in that, oh, they talked about law, but that the law they talked about wasn't God's law. Yeah. It was moral laws replaced with yeah. all sorts of things that aren't directly commanded by God so that we need that external yeah. word. And, of the and we, are, we are prone to take the law and abuse it against ourselves because our hearts are broken and sinful. So we're going to take this law, which is good and right and holy, according to Paul, which is then according yeah. to God, right? Um, that we're going to take this law and we're going to pervert it and use it in a way against ourselves that just isn't even appropriate. Um, that's why you need somebody from outside of you. And not that the person who's outside of you is perfect in any way, shape, or form, but they're going to be coming at it from God's word. And, and you'll know if it's in line with what God says or not. Um, it has nothing to do then with, with the way that your heart is perverted. Um, it has to do with the way that God is actually speaking. And that's incidentally um, a really, it's a very good case for 
things like an historic liturgy because yes. these words we we have all agreed these are the words that we should be using to forgive sins or to ask for forgiveness or or yes. to convict people and so these are the words that we know are from god's word we don't have to fudge them we don't have to hedge our bets these are all of these things um <clears throat> And so if, if we look at the liturgy and we say, this is our script, then, then we know that this is the script that we need to go on. And when we're not, then we can easily be like, well, you know, then this is just my opinion, or this is how I think about it, or God's not really going to judge me, you know? I mean, so it really becomes otherwise, when we look into ourselves, mm -hmm. it's an abuse. Yeah. And I think it, it's also, you know, along with pointing to the historic liturgy and, and its value, it also points to the value of having accountability. Yeah. Right. Having like being under a, in a local congregation. Uh, and you know, of course, I know that there are some people who you know, email me and say, like, I want to go to a Lutheran church, but, you know, I'm in a country where they don't exist. You know, that, I understand that's a different circumstance as well. But, um, you know, you need to be in a local body. You need to have yeah. accountability. You, you shouldn't be going to your buddy that, you know, just over the Internet to get absolution from them for your sins. Uh, God set up. <laughs> the church for a reason. And, and I think it's, it's also, it's also a reason for churches not to just be independent congregations yeah. without any oversight. accountability whatsoever. Yeah, I'm we we go need oversight. All of us own. do. <clears throat> right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's actually a really bad thing when a pastor or a church thinks that they can go their own way. Um, yeah. You know, that they can stand alone. We should, we should always be looking. And, and honestly, this is one of the one, this is one of the reasons I actually, as frustrated as I get with my denomination, it's one of the reasons I love the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, is we go out of our way as much as we can to find other church bodies in our country and throughout the world that are in agreement with, with the correct Christian doctrine. Um, and whether they call themselves Lutheran or not doesn't really matter. It's because they, if they're in agreement, they'll look at the Book of Concord and go, oh yeah, we totally agree with this because the Book of Concord is a right exposition of God's word. And so we're looking for that all the time and we're joining with these churches all over the world trying um, to, to make this our shared confession. We're looking for that unity. That's why Jordan and I are together. I mean, we, you know, being ALC and, and LCMS, we're, we're together because we're preaching the same thing. But we're looking at this and saying we want to be unified in all of these things. And even though we're operated by, by different governances, um, our denominations are both responsible to, one, uh, to each other. And so if the LCMS goes off track, the AALC is going to come alongside and say, no, get it back together or, or we have to go. And same yeah. thing with the AALC. If, if they start going weird, the LCMS comes in and says, you know, get it together or, or we have to leave you guys. Um, and so we're not even seeking that just among, you know, our pastors with our, our winkles, our, our little circuits, um, you know, with our districts, with the synod. We're actually looking at that as the church across the world, across space and time, being responsible to each other. Because, and then we can hold each other accountable in this way. And, and that's ultimately the biggest we can go. <laughs> I mean, if we could go bigger, yeah, yeah. We, you know, all right, so now we're going to join with the churches on Mars, you know, kind of thing. Well, yeah, I mean, we've got the Galactic Federation, so don't That's right. That. That's right. So, I mean, you know, we're looking at that and we should be able to hold all that. Uh, because we need to be accountable one to another. And when a pastor yeah. specifically, I, Jordan, nine and a half times out of 10, when a pastor or a church wants to go it alone, there is some major moral yeah. error there. Um, I, I, have, I am very hard. I say nine and a half because I'm very hard pressed to find or to think of a church on its own that has not gone bizarre. Uh, for some reason or another. And yeah, they, they do. I think we also do, though, have to distinguish between, you know, because I know a number of congregations that are currently independent because they have left heterodox church bodies. That's a different right? thing. Yeah. And, and I'm talking about a church that goes it alone yes. because they're, you know, that, that's just, that's a, a very different thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And distinguish between that. No, these are the churches that are, are leaving because, um, you know, the, it may be, be, they're probably saying the other churches. Are, are doing it separately but you know those individual churches are i'll bet you they're looking for accountability out there somewhere yeah these other churches yeah. that do it on their own and, and want to stay their own they're not looking for that accountability and again that's just because you're messing up this law and gospel thing that's right. really all that it is it kind of, it's a very simple thing but it has such huge uh long-reaching effects yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, um, I think we are probably close to an hour at this point. I don't even know what the heck time we started. Do you know what time we started? I don't know. Um, <laughs> we started streaming 54 minutes ago. Um, we got some dislikes on our video already. Yeah, we do. So that's good. Um, well, probably the Roman Catholic guy who said that we should pray the rosary. Yeah, probably. Or Paul Washer fans. I don't know. Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> anyway. Um, so um, we're probably going to end in just a minute here, but um, Pastor Polzin, why don't you tell everyone out, uh, you know, where they can find you a little bit of maybe about your congregation, if they want to, well, if they want to visit, I know like this whole time is a weird time to do that, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, what, tell us a little bit about kind of yeah. what people find you. Well, yeah, it is a weird time. We've, I, you know, what's weird is I contacted Jordan at the beginning of this pandemic quarantine. I was like, Hey, I got time on my hands. And he was like, all right, well, six months later, we'll do this. Uh, anyway. Um, so <laughs> I know, yeah, right? I'm the pastor, I'm the pastor here at St. Peter Emanuel, uh, Lutheran church and school, uh, in Milwaukee. We're on the, the Northwest side. If anybody's listening in the Milwaukee area, um, we never closed. Uh, we operated within the government's mandates and we interpreted those uh, as best as we could um, between March what 21 and June 14th we did 100 services because uh, we just kept going and uh, thankfully uh, we were able to open our doors really to our congregation as it is uh, with the, the current mandates that we're under um, I'm still very concerned about some of the mandates I think some of them are not constitutional mandates that have been handed down um, but until those are fought in court uh, we are a small congregation in a big building. And so we, can, we are doing life pretty much as normal. Um, you know, we are taking precautions and things like that, wearing masks, you know, we obey the government in every place that we're able. Um, but uh, it certainly has been a challenge over these 10 months. Um, I'm very much looking forward to all of this being done uh, one way or the other. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really been a, a, uh, a blessing in so many ways, I think, to do this. And it's been like a really big hardship. Um, you know, many of your listeners prob probably know, I don't know. Uh, my dad died back in February before all of this began. And so actually the pandemic has really helped in a lot of grief because you are you just have to work through it. Uh, you don't really have a choice. Um, and so, uh, you know, to that extent, it, it's it's been very, very good. Um, the school's back open. We've been operating in Milwaukee. Um, and uh, we have students in the building. We've only had a few cases of COVID at disparate times. So we've been very lucky and we're, we're moving our way through there. Uh, so if you're uh, in the Milwaukee area and you're looking, you are tired of your kids living in your house for school and work, or, you know, <laughs> school, you know uh, bring them here, especially if you qualify for choice dollars, we'll, we'll take that um, and educate your kid if we got room. So um, yeah, you can find me in a lot of different places. Uh, most readily you can find all the information on twitter and that's just at lewis polzine uh that's lewis spelled the right way um and uh polzine spelled the right way too so um but uh that's really where i, I do most of my stuff uh yeah. facebook is not really anything uh post my sermons through there there's a link in my uh profile to follow for that so um i see you know what standard criteria do you use to determine if you need to disobey a government order to keep your church open uh, i use two standards one is um, the first standard is, is what they're asking me to do, uh, going against God's word. Um, and you kind of have to have a little bit of a, an understanding of what they're saying there. Um, you know, if they're saying, you know, you can't ever meet, then I think that's a big problem. If they're saying you can meet under these circumstances, um, then that's a little bit of, of a different question. Um, if you're, if they say, well, churches have to do this, but other businesses don't, then I also look at that. That's my second standard, which is to say that's not a constitutional order. And so as long as it's a mandate, then I'm probably not going to do it. Um, and I'll get the Alliance Defending Freedom to work with me on that. Um, so I kind of I kind of toe that line and, and I try to do as much as we can. As much as I'm, I mean, a mask is not against God's word. And in fact, um, right. you know, the government is saying this will help your neighbor, whether the masks do anything at all, the government says, this is going to help your neighbor. So until it's proven that it's like, that they're horrible, 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 or the government says, don't do it. You know, we're going to wear masks. That's just the way that's going to be. Uh, washing your hands is not against God's word. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it says it's, <laughs> we should wash, um, you know, so we do that and, and sitting separately. That's a harder part. Um, 
you know, if the government were to say not sing, I would have a really hard time with that too. Uh, because in God's word, we're commanded to, to sing. Um, so I, I can't make a decision for every single church. I can only make the decisions for myself. And I asked my church to listen to me. And if they would like to fight me on any of it, that's perfectly fine. And we can have that discussion and uh, come to some kind of agreement. But um, generally it's, it's, you know, I try to use God's word as much as I'm able and anything that's not in violation of that, then I go with it as much as I can. So um, I think if I can add anything valuable to that, uh, which I don't know if I can, I, I, the thing I would say is we've always wondered. Be, yeah, I know. Uh, be gracious to your pastor like <laughs> this, be, d- depending on whatever they choose to do, because honestly, it, it's such a hard circumstance for those in ministry, because no matter what decisions you make, mm-hmm. you are going to upset some of your congregation. And it's um, always about half. Yep. That, that's, and every, everybody's dealing with this. So be gracious to your pastor, even if, you know, you feel like they're either too strict or too loose about what's going on right now and restrictions. Um, understand that they're probably trying to do what is best in accord with the word of God while simultaneously trying to be safe and deal with Romans 13 and how that plays itself out. And it, it's just not easy. So it's kind, not easy at all. <laughs> I, I, I hate to think that churches will be, you know, split over this issue, but I'm sure that that will happen, you know, I'm, over, I'm sure. which is awful. Um, but yes. anyway, um, okay. One, the last question is what kind of beard oil do you use? Do you use beard oil, Jordan? I used to use beard oil, but um, my wife is like allergic to it. Mm. And I've tried all different kinds. Mm-hmm. So I would rather not or have to stay away from her. So yeah, I use, <laughs> so I don't uh, use any, I use uh, the two bits man. Um, you can find it on Amazon. It works pretty well. <clears throat> they had a, a blood orange one and I, I think they might've discontinued it, but that's the one I had been using. Now I use uh, uh, their pine uh, yeah. one. So, um, but yeah, it, it really um, uh, is very nice. It makes it so luxurious. It's nice. I mean, I do use beard shampoo and conditioner, but well, no, of course, no who beard oil. Right? No, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll use a little wax. Depends on how unruly my beard is that day. Yeah, yeah. I used to use wax actually quite a bit, but that was when it was longer. I can yes. usually keep it kind of neat at this. You point. know what? You know what I've discovered is, is, gosh, your people are gonna like stop listening to us after this. Um, I'm surprised anyone's still listening. But yeah, uh, go no. ahead. <laughs> Masks have been awful for my beard. Oh, they're horrible for beards. I, my it's beard usually it's like sticks out like this after yeah. I take it off. And I I'm agree. like walking around going, hey, look, I've got a mustache on my chin. Um, you know, and it's just, it's the weirdest thing. So I've, I, I just bought new masks and they come down over the beard and they kind of hug the bottom of your chin. And Is so that per- I have a big fat face too. So that's, that doesn't make it easier. Are they, they're not purposefully for beards, are they? This one is, yeah. Oh, it is. Because I've yeah. done all this looking and I couldn't find anything for I'll send you. I'll send you a link, George. Okay. You can right. put it up if people ask. Yeah, we can put that up. But yeah, you no, know, it comes down and it just kind of it sits right under the beard and it's really nice. I mean, this, this is like the real tragedy right now is the the damage to our beards caused by the mask. I and know. Well, and the difficult, difficult thing, Jordan, is, you know, <laughs> you know how your mask rides up and then fogs up your glasses with it sitting under your beard? Your mask doesn't rise up. It's really nice. All right. You'll have to send me those. I'll send you the link. Anyway, thanks so much, everybody. If you are still listening at this point, I don't know why you are. No, uh, but um, yeah, please do. Uh, if you don't already subscribe to the YouTube channel and subscribe uh, on your podcast app to the podcast as well. And we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.